I am Gigi Kilro. I am a survivor of incest, dating violence, and two separate sexual assaults. One of the first challenges I faced is that I lost my mom to cancer when I was only five years old. And it's very difficult to lose a parent at any age, but especially when you're a child. And for me, all of the things that I would face in my life, I did not have a mother to help me through all of it. So people have often said, why are you so strong? How did you become so strong? And I said, well, you know, I learned at an early age that the main person that I had to depend on was myself. So for me, the sadness was, you know, being molested by my half-brother at the age of four. And that is something that I blocked for 50 years. When the memories came up later in my life, they absolutely almost killed me. I started having nightmares. I wet the bed. I didn't want to leave my house. It took a very long time for me to work through that trauma. And that was repressed trauma that I carried in my body. When I was living with my grandmother, I started dating a young man. My grandmother loved him. You know, he was from a very affluent family. It was my first time having attention from the opposite sex. But sadly in time, he became abusive. For anyone who's been in an abusive relationship, it doesn't happen right away. It happens very slowly and very gradually. And he would say things to me like, you're fat, you're ugly, you're stupid. You might as well stay with me. You'll never amount to anything. And I believed him. I absolutely believed him. And he would punch me. He would kick me. So all of through high school was horrible for me. I just could not wait to get away from him. Emotional abuse can leave just as many scars as physical abuse. I have scars on my left hand where he literally dug his fingernails into me. Those will be with me until the day I die. They're visible. But the emotional abuse, the feeling of never being good enough, I catch myself now because those feelings have transferred for years. You know, when I was up for a job, I think, well, I can't do that. I'm not smart enough. So after high school, I went on to college. Um, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. This little guy, his name was Jimmy. He walked up to me. He took me by the hand. He looked me dead in the eyes and he said, I like you. And my heart just melted. I said, that's it. I want to work with students with special needs. And that little boy will never know he changed my life. And so again, I always say kindness matters. You never know the smallest thing you can say to someone, anyone will change their life. And that little boy changed mine. When I was a sophomore, my roommate set me up on a blind date with an acquaintance from one of her classes. Nobody tells you 95% of the time you are going to be harmed by someone that you know and someone that you should be able to trust. So I go on this blind date with him, not thinking anything because, you know, he knew my roommate. So he says, well, let's go back to my fraternity house and listen to some music. So we do, and he starts making drinks. He starts pushing and then he started making moves on me. I was a virgin. I was very clear. I was not interested in having sex with this person that I don't even know. Sadly, you know, among all of my, no, 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 I don't want to do this, he raped me. And it was violent and it was painful. And in the middle of it, he called me Leslie, which was his ex-girlfriend's name. I don't even remember walking back to my dorm, but when I got back to my dorm, I didn't know what to do. I went into the bathroom and not to be graphic, but there was blood in my underwear. And I thought my period started and I tried to insert a tampon and it was excruciating. So I knew something was terribly wrong. I'm 18 years old. I'm away from home. I don't know what to do. There was no women's center on campus at the time. I did something else that a lot of survivors also do is after that experience, I pushed it away. I could kind of compartmentalized it and I tucked it away because at the time I thought, well, if I don't think about it, I'm gonna be okay. And again, no one said, you should go talk to a counselor. This would really help you. Nope, I just pretended it wasn't there. So I graduated, so I took a job and I worked in a daycare center for three-year-old children. I'm now 22. There was a, a guy who was friends with the owner. He was kind of like the janitor. He did things for her. And he had a huge crush on the woman that taught next to me. And he would come to me. He suggested we go for a drink after work. Again, I'm trusting, not thinking anything of this. So we go for a drink and not to insult any men who may be listening, but there are some men that like to talk about themselves. And he talked about himself and I'm really bored and I just want to go home, but I'm being the friendly Gigi listening, blah, blah, blah. So we get back to the daycare. And I always say that we all have this little voice that I call our uh-oh voice where someone says something or asks you to do something and in, and in your gut, it's like, no, don't do it. He said, well, let's come inside. I want to show you something I'm working on. And my uh-oh voice was screaming, don't do it. But again, I'm the people pleaser. Okay. So I go in and we're inside. My classroom was on the right-hand side. I walked in to get something from my desk and he starts making moves on me. Now it's about eight o'clock at night. There's no one in the building. And again, I am adamant. I am not interested in being 
intimate with this man by any means. Before I know it, I am on my stomach, on the floor in my classroom, where I teach three-year-old children every day, where he proceeded to rape and then sodomize me. First thing in my mind, honestly, was no one's going to believe me. They're going to say, what were you doing in the building with him after hours? He's such a nice guy. He would never do that. I don't remember driving home. I didn't tell my closest friends because I thought, you know what? No one is going to believe that this has happened to me for a second time. They're just not going to believe it. Now my eating disorder really kicks in. And now I am really putting on the pounds and I am becoming more promiscuous. A couple of months after this happened, I thought to myself, I don't want to be here anymore because I didn't know how to handle it. I I just didn't know how to deal with it. And I attempted to take my life one night. I didn't want to die, but you know, I was someone who, I didn't know how to make that pain go away. And it was not going away. I would have to go into that building every day to work with these precious three-year-old children and look at that spot on the floor where I was raped and sodomized. I I couldn't do it anymore. I thought to myself, all right, what do you want to do with your life? Because now I had resigned from the preschool because I could not go into that building anymore. So I went back to the university I graduated from and I got my master's with certification to work with students with special needs. And then I got my first teaching job uh, with students with special needs and it brought me so much joy. So everything is good. I have a great apartment. I now have it. I have a cat. You know, one of my students gave me a kitten and I'm happy and I start dating a really nice guy. Things are going great. And one night we decided to rent a movie. We went in and we picked a movie and it was called The Prince of Tides and it starred Barbara Streisand and Nick Nolte. Anyone um, who's familiar with the movie, you know, I chose it because I loved her music and I just thought he was handsome. Well, what I didn't know in the movie was she's a psychiatrist and he is one of her clients. And there's a scene in the movie where he has a flashback to where he and his sister and mother are all sexually assaulted by three men that broke into their home. When they showed his sister on the floor in little black and white saddle shoes and her little shoes were moving up and down like this. I went into a major flashback. And if you have ever experienced a flashback, they're one of the scariest things that'll ever happen to you. You literally go right back to where you were assaulted, at least I did. And I have to tell you, it was full blown panic attack. I started crying and sobbing and shaking. And my boyfriend at the time had no idea what was wrong with me because I hadn't shared anything. And for me, that was truly the moment when I knew that it was time to talk with someone because all those ghosts from my past just came up. It was the moment that they came up and it was like, okay, I'm ready. So I have to tell you that I am incredibly blessed because the first therapist I reached out to was truly the perfect match for me. She knew just how to handle me and you know, I trusted her. And when you have been in a situation where you have been in an abusive relationship and you have been sexually assaulted, you know, it's not easy to trust people, honestly but I immediately trusted her and I I call her my angel, you know, and for all of the things that I've been through, I'm telling you, she was a gift. And so we started working together and it was the best thing for me. And I always tell her, you know, I don't think I would be here now if it weren't for her. And she said, you did the work. And I said, yes, but you believed in me, you know, and when you are someone and if you're listening and can identify if, if, you know, you haven't had a lot of people believe in you, when you do have someone that believes in you, it can change your life. And she really changed my life. I lost my dad, which was incredibly traumatic because of all the people in my life, he really was my hero. You know, that left a huge hole when I lost him. And I'm very blessed that, you know, my dad really showed me what unconditional love is you know, and how blessed that I did have that with him. The situation where the incest came up for me was I went to visit my half brother in the hospital. Now we have different last names, you know, we have different dads. He lives, you know, in a state far away, but his wife had shared on social media that he had blood clots in his lungs. So I thought something inside of me said go. Always had the feeling that our mother had been molested by her own brother because of a phone call I had overheard when I was a child. And I gotta tell you, there's one picture of him. He was incredibly handsome, but there's just something about him that was evil. And I don't know how to, I don't know how to explain it. There was just something. And so I always just had a feeling in my gut something was wrong. So I asked my half brother, now it's just he and I in the room, his wife was not there. I said to him, do you think uncle so-and-so hurt mom? To which he replied, well, you said incest was okay. And I felt the air leave the room. And then he said, well, I figured if mom found out, she would have cut me up and put me in garbage bags. And when I tell you my world stopped, I 
made an excuse that I had to get on the road and I can tell you I don't remember the hours and hours on the road driving home. It is only by the grace of God that I didn't have a car accident. That was the moment right there where he admitted what he did to me. And in the same token, perpetrators will do, you said it was okay. I was a four-year-old precious little girl, precious innocent child. Four-year-olds don't give consent. When I got home, the first thing I thought of is, you know, I think as human beings, the first need we all have is to feel safe. And you know what? I didn't feel safe. And I didn't know if I was ever going to feel safe again. I literally locked every door in my house. I locked every window. You know, I picked up my cat. I kissed his face a hundred times. And then I went into a fetal position on the couch and I didn't move. For me, the experience of the repressed memories, it's like they didn't all come flooding up at once. That's not how it was for me. But it's like I would get a, a glimpse of something. And it was almost like I was watching it happen. Of all of the things I have been through between, you know, losing my mother and the rape in college, the rape in the workplace, the abusive, you know, relationship, losing my dad, like through all of those things, this was the hardest. Because your family members are supposed to be the people that you trust, right? Again, it, you know, it's not the boogeyman. It's not the man chasing you down the alley. It's someone that you know. And, you know, as a four-year-old child, I should have been able to trust my brother. I worked really hard and kept going and kept going. And I retired uh, from the field of special ed after 32 years. Loved it. Loved every minute of it. It was amazing. And after that happened, you know, I worked even more on my healing. And I really started to take care of my body. In my book, there's a great saying that I share that says, self-care is how you take your power back. And I thought, you know what? I need to practice this compassion for myself that I've always been able to have for other people. And so I set out on a journey for my health. I've learned what boundaries are. And you know what? That's another thing that I had to learn as a survivor is when you've had your own boundaries obliterated like I did, you don't know what your own personal boundaries are. So I had to learn. And you know, I also learned that the word no is a complete sentence, right? Friends would often say, do you want to do this or do that? And I would say, yeah, okay. And I didn't want to, but I didn't know how to say no. And you know what? It feels good to say, no, no thanks. So after I retired, I took some time to do some things around my house. And for whatever reason, I don't know why, I reached out to the women's center in the town that I grew up because they hold um, a Take Back the Night event. And Take Back the Night, if you're not familiar, I believe started in the 70s, uh, mainly across college campuses where survivors would speak and share their stories and encourage support for other survivors. So I reached out to the women's center in my hometown and I said, look, I know you're going to do a Take Back the Night. I'm older. I know you typically have younger people speak, but I am someone who has lived a lifetime of abuse and, you know, things and violence, but I have gotten to a point where I'm incredibly happy and incredibly peaceful. And they said, oh, we'd love to have you. So I had a chance to share. And let me tell you, survivors listening to this, there is nothing more powerful when you have found your voice and you can share your story. Because you know what? The shame that you carry starts to be chipped away little by little. And that night really was magical for me. I They gave me a standing ovation. Ah! I started crying. And let me tell you, to be able to share that in my hometown, which is a small town of only about 4,000 people, was amazing. And a couple of the women that were there said, hey, are you a national speaker? And I started laughing. I'm like, uh, uh, hell no. I said, well, you should think about doing this. So you know what? I was driving home and I thought, you know what? Maybe I could help other survivors. I started reaching out and making contacts and I'm in Pennsylvania and I was led to the Office of Victim Advocate, which is in Harrisburg, the capital. They have a division called Resilient Voices and I'm a volunteer speaker for Resilient Voices and um, we have the opportunity to share our stories and encourage survivors at different events. I'm thrilled that I've been able to speak at several colleges and universities across the state. They also have a program called Impact of Crime classes. Now this, you know, I said, I don't want to do that. And again, I laugh and I think, never say never because you know what? If the universe wants you to do something, honey, it's going to make sure you do it. So I also go into prisons. There are 23 state prisons in Pennsylvania and 19 of them offer the impact of crime classes where survivors like myself of all different types of, of crimes go into classes and actually share our stories. And it's been an amazing experience because the inmates that participate in these programs, they're vetted. There's certain criteria 
it. They have to, to prove that they want to change and better themselves. The compassion that I have felt and that has been shown towards me in the prisons is something I never expected. It has been an amazing experience. My personal goal is to get in every prison that offers this program, and I've been to 13 of the 19. In Pennsylvania, there are only two prisons that are female only, so I've been to one, and those women broke my heart because, you know, when they opened up about what they had been through, I would say 95% of them are also survivors. I've written a book, which is something I never thought I would do because I was never anyone that said, I want to write a book. But I had a friend and her daughter-in-law wanted to do a book and she wanted each chapter to be a survivor story. She asked if I wanted to, I said, yeah. So I actually condensed everything into like 10 pages and, and the young woman didn't do anything. But I had friends say to me, well, Gigi, why don't you write a book? And I'm like, nobody's going to read my book. They said, well, well why don't you? And I thought, all right. So I did. It's called From Within, My Path of Hope and Healing from Sexual Abuse. And let me tell you, it has been an amazing experience to be able to write a book because for me to show where I was, what I have been through and where I am now, it is like the optimum of when you're in therapy and your therapist says, you should journal. Well, let me tell you, here's my journal. It's 85 pages long. What I wanted to do in doing this also was I know myself when I was looking for books to read during my healing, when I would see a book that was thick, I was overwhelmed. I was like, I can't, no, nope, no, nope, like I couldn't. My attention span was not that. So I, I wanted something that would be an easy read for survivors. And you know, it's not all gloom and doom. You know, there's some humor in here. There are some wonderful memories. And, you know, I wanted it to be a little bit of everything for survivors. I've included resources in the back, including the National Sexual Assault Hotline, the National Dating Abuse Helpline, the National Sexual Violence Resource Center, the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network, which is RAIN, support for male survivors and survivors of incest anonymous, websites and phone numbers. Like I said, when all of these things were happening to me, I didn't have any resources, you know, no one talked about it. Things are very different now. It is still happening, but you're much likely to find help now. When I was about nine or 10 years old, uh, living with my grandmother, I remember uh, my grandmother and aunt were in the kitchen. And in our house, there was this wooden swinging door that came between the kitchen and the dining room that was usually open. But I remember, um, for whatever reason, on this Saturday, the door was closed. And I heard my grandmother say to my aunt, I'm so worried about Gigi. She's so afraid of men. The only man she wants to be around is her father. I thought that was very interesting. Well, here, Obviously, in my situation, it's so interesting because, like I said, having blocked the memories of the incest, you know, I, I did feel safe with my dad. I mean, my dad was my protector. And I have to tell you that all these years later, and, and sadly, I lost him in 2005, and I don't know if he knew anything for sure that happened or suspected. I, I'm assuming he suspected the way he kind of whisked me away in the middle of the night after my mom passed away. I think it's very interesting that at the age of 9 or 10, obviously I was showing signs of being afraid of men. I call him my hero, you know, and I, I do think he got me away from my abuser. If people can see, I mean, not everyone is going to heal and go speak like I do, but I think the message of, you know, finding your voice is so powerful. You know, even survivors who finally share it with one person opens the door, I think, to healing. I think that's incredibly important. And, and like I said, I learned all of this blindly, you know, completely. I've, I've fumbled into all of this, which I didn't know was the way to go and everything. So I did it the hard way. <laughs> I did it the very hard way, you know, but I guess it was meant to be for me to do it the hard way, you know. But And so for the pictures, I also sent two copies of my gallery of joy. So you can see, as you can see, just what the black and white pictures look like, um, and I sent a cover of my book, a picture of me at my heaviest, and then that saying that no one has the right to extinguish the light. Yeah, I found this really cool artist that did this real cool script with that. 